بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and we resume talking about ثلاثة الأصول for Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab and the last time we covered the rest of talking about Islam and as you recall when we want to define and talk about the religion of Allah because the three fundamentals the three principles of, of our fundamental of these principles are first to know Allah secondly to know your religion thirdly to know your messenger and these are the questions you will be asked about in your grave so the two angels munkar wanakir will come to you and ask you who is your lord what is your religion and what did this man or who is this man who came to you what did this man do and you have to answer these questions in order to be saved in your grief. The accountability, the questioning, the reckoning on the day of judgment is a different story. So this is why we're studying it so that we can, inshallah, prepare for these questions, not only by knowledge, but by action, because knowing it would not help you in the grave. You won't be able to answer just by simply memorizing it. Your way of life is what will enable you to answer or will fail you to answer, may Allah protect the soul. So we spoke about Islam and the pillars of Islam. And we said that there are six pillars of Iman. The first one is to believe in Allah and we spoke about that. And today we will speak about the second pillar which is the angels. And this came into in the hadith of Jibreel, which we also talked about when he came in the shape of a man that nobody knew. And he asked the Prophet والسلام, a number of questions among them were, was, what is Islam? What is Iman? So the Prophet said, Al Iman is to believe in Allah, and we talk about that. Then he said, And to believe in his angels. Now, has any one of us seen an angel? The answer is no then why is it an article of Iman to believe in them? Because Allah complimented the Muslims for believing in the unseen. We have not seen Allah. We have not seen heaven and hell. We have not seen the devils. We have not seen the torment of the grave. We have not seen the beginning of the creation of this universe. Yet, we believe in it as if we had seen it. And our conviction in it is unconditional, unquestionable. Why? Because this is what Islam is all about. To believe and to have the conviction of whatever Allah tells us or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And the angels are a creation of Allah Azza wa Jal. <clears throat> if you read the Quran and the Sunnah, you will find a lot of information about them. For example, what were they created of? The angels were created of light. The origin of their creation is light. 
while the origin of our creation as human beings is clay, soil. And the origin of the creation of the devils, Satan and his offspring, is fire. So these are three different sources of creation. When were they created? This is something we have no knowledge of. Allah did not disclose that to us, but we certainly know that they were created before the humans. Because in chapter 2, Allah tells us about the conversation that took place between him and the angels when he said to them that I would be creating a human to succeed one another on earth. And the angel said, why would you create something that would cause corruption and bloodshed? And Allah said, I know and you do not know. So we know that they came before the creation of mankind. How big are they? Well, we know that they are powerful creatures of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, O oh, you who believe, protect yourselves from a fire that its fuel are people and rocks. And supervising such a fire are angels who are tough and rough. They do not disobey Allah Azza wa Jal and they do exactly what they're commanded to do. The greatest of all angels is Jibreel, peace be upon him. The Prophet said that he saw some, I saw him once in his original form, sitting on his throne, blocking what I can see between the heavens and the earth. So he's blocking the whole horizon. And he had 600 wings falling from them, diamonds and rubies and emeralds and precious stones. This was Jibril. Among the great, huge angels are the carriers of the throne. And we know that there are eight angels carrying the throne on their shoulders and back. The Prophet said, Alayhi Salaam, I was permitted to speak about one of those who carry the throne between his earlobe and his shoulder, the distance of 700 years for a traveler to cross. 700 years to travel just to reach from the distance of his earlobe to his shoulder. They have a, a, a wings, have, as I've just stated about Jibreel, and Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in Surah Fatr that they have wings in twos, threes, or fours. So how to imagine that? It's beyond imagination, so we just believe in it. And whenever the name angel crosses your mind, it is synonymous with beauty. If you read Surah Yusuf, when Yusuf is be upon him, who was given half of the human beauty, when he entered upon the women, as the wife of the Aziz plotted so that they would not blame her for falling in love with him. When they saw him, they accidentally cut their hands with the knives instead of cutting the fruit. They were so mesmerized. And they said, no, this is not a human being. This is an honorable angel. So. Our nature 
states that angels are beautiful, devils are ugly. And they are not in one category or one level. They differ in their sizes, in their physical appearance, in their status as angels. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, when asked by Jibreel, Jibreel asked him, what do you think, or what do you consider the people of the battle of Badr? And the Prophet said, alayhi salam, those are among the best of us. And Jibreel said, also we angels believe that the angels who attended the battle of Badr are among the best of the angels. They do not drink. They do not eat, as mentioned in the Quran, when they came to, to Prophet Ibrahim, and they refrained from eating. They are never bored or tired from worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. They, they glorify Allah in the day and night. How many of them is there? Well, this is something that only Allah Azza wa Jal knows. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُوْ And no one knows the soldiers of our Lord except Him. But the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, that there is a structure on the seventh heaven. And it's called Al-Baytul Al-Ma'mur. And this was mentioned in the Quran. Allah swore by it. And this structure, some say, it is parallel to the Kaaba. And it is to the angels, similar to the Kaaba, to the humans. The Prophet told us that every day, 70,000 angels enter that structure. And when they leave, they never return back to it again. So you do the count. Every day, 70,000 of angels enter. So in like a week, that's half a million. In a month, that's two million. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows how many months had passed since angels have been entering that structure al bayt al ma'mur do, do we know their names? We should. We know Jibreel. We know Mikael. We know Israfil. And these three are the top three angels. And they're responsible for giving life. Jibreel gives the spiritual life because he's responsible for revelation, al wahi He's the one who conveys the Quran that revives our hearts to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Israfil is the one who is responsible for blowing the trumpet so that the people would be resurrected and they will be reborn again for the Day of Judgment. Mikael is the one responsible for rainfall. So he's the one who gives life to earth through growing the crops that animals and humans need. As for Malik, he's the one in charge of hellfire. And we know that he has 19, or there are 19 angels only taking care of hellfire, those in it. So you can imagine how powerful these angels are. There is Munkar, Wanakir, and they are the two angels that come in a very horrible appearance to the people when they are in their graves to give them the questions that would determine whether they will wait in a garden of paradise in their graves or it would be a pit of hellfire. There is Harut 
and Marut, and they were mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, who descended to earth and to test the people, asking them not to follow them and not to learn from them black magic and sorcery. Because if they do, they will be committing shirk and kufr. So those who refuse to listen and insist on learning, they have committed the major sin of leaving Islam and being doomed to hell. They have abilities of taking forms such as the form of human beings. Many companions saw Jibreel in the form of another companion known as Dihya Kalbi, but it was Dihya, it was Jibreel taking his form. And they came in the Quran to many messengers and prophets of Allah in the form of human beings. They're fast, they have different jobs and occupations. Some of them is given the responsibility of revelation, such as Jibreel, rain, such as Mikael, blowing in the trumpet, such as Israfil, taking people's lives, such as the angel of death and his aids. And a lot of the Muslims call the, angels, uh, the angel of death as Israel, but this is not authentic and there is no authentic reference to his name as such. As Allah described him in the Quran in so many different places as Malakul Maut, the angel of death. So we should just keep it as it is. And um, there is angels who are responsible for protecting us as humans, whether we travel or reside, whenever we go out or stay in our homes, there are angels ordered by Allah to protect us until our destiny comes. There are angels who are scribes, they write good or bad deeds that we do. And there are the guardians of, or the custodians of paradise. And there are the custodians of hellfire. Among the duties of angels, that there are angels who were responsible to uh, blow or breathe the life in an embryo that is in the womb of its mother and to dictate whether it is male or female will it be righteous or otherwise and about their provisions and about their uh, uh, lifespan all of this with allah's knowledge and allah's authorization among them are those who carry the throne of allah those who roam the earth searching for gatherings of knowledge like ours at the moment, they come and they make dua for all of us learning the religion of Allah. Among them is the angel of the mountains responsible for collapsing it, earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, etc. And there are angels that simply keep on worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal prostrating, bowing, making dhikr. So this was a brief, uh, it's not an introduction, but yeah, uh, um, something to remind you of what the angels are and how beautiful these creatures are. So it is an article of demand to believe in them, but believing them includes that you believe in their existence, believing in those whom Allah told us about their names, such as Jibreel, Israfil, Mikael, etc. Believing in their description, which is mind-blowing, 
to know that Jibril is so huge and so big, we know that he uplifted the village of Sodom, who used to be doing the act of homosexuality, with the tip of one of his wings to the skies and then dropped the whole village upside down. So they are so huge and powerful. They have the ability to um, uh, transform their shapes. And we also have to believe with their work and different tasks that Allah had set for them. When you believe in the angels, this makes you believe in the greatness of the one who created them. So if this is how great and powerful they are, this just gives you a glimpse of the infinite power and greatness of Allah, the Almighty. Also, when you believe in the angels, you become thankful and grateful for Allah for appointing such magnificent creatures to help us, to protect us, to guide us at times. And this also helps us to love the angels for whom they are. We know that they love us as we love them. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, when Allah Azza wa Jal loves a servant of his, and may Allah Azza wa Jal make me and all those watching us among those whom Allah loves. Wallahi, it's one of the, it is the greatest honor one can achieve. If Allah loves you, who cares about anyone else? If Allah Azza wa Jal loves you, the whole world loves you. Regardless of how rich or poor you are, regardless whether you're white or black, when Allah loves you, everything loves you. Imagine the Prophet said, when Allah loves a servant of his, he calls on to Jibil, O oh, Jibil, I love my servant so and so so love him this is an order and jibreel loves that servant then jibreel goes to the people of the heavens all the angels in the heavens and he says to them allah the almighty loves his servant so and so so love him and they all love him then allah places acceptance for his for his servant on earth sometimes you wonder Akhi, why do people love so and so and they don't love me why do they love this person who doesn't have a phd who's not an influential but subhanallah, everybody, whenever they hear the name of so-and-so, they just say nice words about him. Why is that? Because this is the love of Allah given to Jibreel, given to the angels of the heavens, and then the acceptance is placed for him on earth. So when Allah loves you, this is the greatest honor and you must be the happiest man or woman on earth. So the first article of faith, to believe in Allah. Then to believe in his angels. Then to believe in the scriptures. And what could be he? And by scriptures, we believe that Allah revealed many scriptures before, which include the Qur'an, which we all believe in. But there are scriptures that we know of 
and there are scriptures that we don't know of. So among the scriptures we know of that there was the Zabur given to Prophet David, there was the Torah given to Prophet Musa, there was the Injil given to Prophet Isa, there were the Suhuf given to uh, Ibrahim and Musa as well. So we have to believe that all that we know and we do not know are from Allah. We believe in what we know by name. We believe that what is authentic. So we believe whatever is authentic in it. So we believe that the Quran is the only one which is 100% authentic. So we believe in it entirely. And we act upon the rulings in it as long as it was not abrogated. And it shows you to believe in the books. What, why do we have to emphasize? Because it shows that our belief as Muslims is one of series of previous religions. What does that mean? It means that if I don't believe in the Torah that was revealed to Prophet Musa, I'm not a Muslim. Yes, I do believe in it. But at the same time, I believe that the Torah that the Jews have in their hands was altered and changed and corrupted. There is a lot in it that is part of the original Torah, but not all of it. So many things were inserted in it, whether it's the Old Testament or what they call the New Testament, which is not the Injil. It's a history book. It's not a revelation given to Prophet Isa, because that's different. The, in, the New Testament is not the Injil. It is something that was written by the apostles and about history, uh, written by historians that are not related to the Injil. And if you read the Bible, the Old Testament, what they call the Torah, and you will find that it cannot be from Allah because it has been changed by humans when they accuse Prophet Nuh of this and that and Prophet Ibrahim of this and that and Prophet Lut of this and that accusing them of some of them of having illicit relationships with their daughters-in-law some of them being drunkards some of them fighting Allah A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Wa Ta'ala Allahu Amma Yaqulu Zalimun Aluun Azeem Such heinous and blasphemous things this can't be from Allah, but we believe in the origin and we believe in the original scripture that was given to Musa to be from Allah. So this is part of articles of faith of Iman. Why? Because this is what we usually use when we speak with atheists. So many times I have different dialogues with atheists and with people who think they know and they want to apply logic. And they say, why is this and that in Islam? Why do you allow women to uh, uh, marry one man and a man can marry four women? And I say, this is not the right approach, Shahi. Do you want to talk about religion? First of all, let's establish the existence of Allah. If he acknowledges and we logic it through and he believes in the existence of Allah and in the beautiful names and attributes of Allah, then it would be only logical that Allah would send us a messenger and would reveal for us a book, a manual, that we can read and follow his instructions. Without the book, there is nothing else for us to abide by and to believe in. And this is why when you ask someone who's following Prophet Nuh, 
And he says, my messenger is Noah. I said, okay, what was his miracle? He would say the flood. So, so show me. I, I don't have any evidences, but it did take place in the past. Okay, past. What, what is it? Who's your messenger? He said, Ibrahim. Peace be upon him. Said, okay. What, are, what was his miracle? Well, there are so many. Among them, he was thrown into raging fire. And nothing happened to him. He said, show me. He said, I don't have anything to show. Okay, the Jews. Who's your messenger? Moses. What is his miracle? Well, he had the staff that could turn into a big python. And he entered his hand and it came white and shining without any harm in it. And he also crossed the sea and Allah opened it to him. And, and, and he said, mm, beautiful, beautiful, nice. Show me. He said, sorry, we don't have any proof. Subhanallah. Okay, Isa. Oh, Jesus, followers, show me. What did he do? Oh, he gave life to the dead. He cured the leopard. He did this and gave sight to the blind. Okay, very nice things. Can you show me? And said, no, this was his time. Okay, I can't believe in this. So they say, okay, what did Muhammad do? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, he got water springing from his finger fingers and filling up a well he whenever he walked the stones used to greet him by saying assalamu alaikum he traveled to the seventh heaven and came back in one hour or two hours he did this he did that and he was given the miracle of all miracles that is the Quran, the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. The one that Allah has challenged the whole of human and the jinn to make a duplicate. If not, then of 10 chapters. If not, then of one chapter. And none could ever produce something as miraculous and magnificent as is. Just, okay, show me. Okay, here's my book. Here's my Quran. Now, this is the miracle that is here to stay until the day of judgment. If you can't prove the miracles of your own messengers, we can as a Muslim. So this is one of the beauty of believing in the books of Allah, the scriptures. Because in worldly measurements, you cannot expect a phone manufacturer to produce state-of-the-art phone without showing you how to operate it. Imagine a computer company or X uh, box or PlayStation 10 and they produce this beautiful device black and black but you don't know what it is. So people say, wow, what a beautiful device. What is it? It says it's a computer. That's, no, no, no. This is a microwave. The third one says, no, this is a satellite receiver. And no one knows what it is. They ask, is there a manual? They said, no, there is no manual. The first thing that comes to mind is, what a stupid manufacturer creating this marvelous, miraculous device and not telling the people what it is or how to use it, Allah Azza wa Jal is exalted from all of this. Allah created this universe and made us the inhabitants of this earth. Not only to just eat and drink and die, He gave us the manual. And He sent us a guide to explain the manual to us and how it works. And this is why we believe in Allah's scriptures and books. Sheikh Nasser, should we continue or stop here? Naam, Sheikh. Um, I think we shall uh, continue for the next five minutes and then we stop and take questions. Okay. So, to believe in Allah, 
to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, the divine books, the scriptures, and to believe in the messengers. And Allah Azza wa Jal could have just simply thrown to us or descended to us his books. But this was not sufficient. There had to be someone to explain, to convey, to complete the Quran with his teachings that are also a revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah's messengers, they are the cream of his creation. They're the top of humanity. The first of all these messengers was Prophet Nuh, peace be upon him. Allah says in the Quran, Inna ilayka, kama awhayna ila Nuh. We've revealed to you, O Muhammad, as we had revealed to Nuh. So this is an indication that he was the first messenger. And in the hadith that Anas narrates in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the long hadith of intercession, this is a very long hadith, everybody knows it, that on the day of judgment, when things get hot and difficult, and Allah Azza wa Jal is angry and accountability has not taken place yet. So all the creations, all the humans are gathered in one place, nude, barefooted, uncircumcised. They go to Adam so that he would intercede at the side of Allah. And they say, Allah created you with his hands. Allah gave life to you. Allah did this and that to you. Don't you see what's happening to us? Ask Allah so that we would be relieved of the suffering we are having at the moment. And he would say, go to Nuh, peace be upon him. He is the first messenger Allah had sent to humanity. So this is an indication that the first one is Nuh and the last one is our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whom Allah described in the Quran as the seal of the prophethood. And he himself said, I am the last messenger and prophet and there's no prophet after me. This is why when we see like Mirza Ghulam Ali or the Baha'is or the Qadianis or all these deviant sects who claim to be Muslims and they claim that their messenger is a messenger and a prophet of Allah after the Prophet these are apostates, these are kuffar, just for believing that there can be a messenger after Muhammad And these messengers of Allah Azza wa Jal, we believe that the greatest of them all is our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yet they are all humans. They do not carry any of the characteristics of lordship or worship. They don't hold any benefit for their own, own selves and they cannot protect themselves from any harm. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran that, O Muhammad, say to them, I do not hold any good for myself and I cannot protect myself from any harm except what Allah wishes. Had I known the unseen, I would have asked for more of goodness. But I don't know the ghayb. I don't know what's coming. So uh, um, Allah described his messengers and prophets as being abd, slaves, servants. And this is the highest praise for them in the Quran. And to believe as an article of faith, to believe in the messengers, this requires or means a number of things. One, to believe that they are all messengers of Allah, which means as Muslims, to disbelieve in one messenger is disbelieving in all of them. 
So if someone says, Achy, I don't believe Jesus was a messenger, with all due respect, this guy cannot be a Muslim. He is a kafir. He is an apostate. He said, but I pray. I fast. I go to Hajj. If you don't believe in all the messengers of Allah unconditionally, you are an apostate and a kafir. And secondly, that we have to believe whatever things that they bring to us. So whatever is authentic and not changed, we have to believe in it. And the Quran tells us what is authentic and what is not. And we have to believe in those whom the Quran gave us their names. So Muhammad, Ibrahim, Isa, Musa, Nuh, Dawood, Sulaiman, Ayyub, uh, uh, Saleh, Hud, etc. All of these are messengers and prophets. We believe in them. But there are a lot more that we still believe in but don't know their names. So we believe that there are messengers and prophets of Allah that we do not know their names. And I think that this brings us to the end of these five minutes. And we um, stop at believing in the day of judgment, insha'Allah. Wallahu a'lam wa nisbatul ilmi ilayhi islam. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. We'll go to the questions now, insha'Allah. Uh, the first question is, Salaamu Alaikum, is it permissible to use permeable uh, halal nail polish? Uh, you know, and then the, so, yeah, that is the first question. Wa Alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There had been many uh, circulations stating that there is what they are, what they call breathable nail polish. And they have diagrams and they say when you put the nail polish on your uh, fingernail and the water comes, it goes in and it touches your um, nails, etc. I don't believe in this. Even physics don't believe in this. Because if this nail polish has a mass and this mass is attached to your nail through glue or any other adhesive, this means that water cannot reach the fingernail. So they can claim it's breathable, they can claim it is, uh, it allows the penetration of water. As a Muslim, you must not use this and perform wudu on it because your wudu would not be valid due to the fact that the water does not reach the nail and Allah knows best. Now, I'm sure the next question is uh, if I lend someone money, if I lend money to my friend and I got it back within a week, does he have to pay uh, zakat on that too? One, one week. See, this is part of the basics that Muslims are ignorant of. I have invited you to join me in the fiqh class on Mondays and Thursdays for free. And it gives you a chance to learn Islam from A to Z. And those who missed it, it's found on YouTube under the name of Usul, U-S-O-O-L. And we've reached 43 segments, 43 hours now. The basics of the cat is one, it has to, has to reach a threshold. If you have below this threshold, you don't have to pay the cat. The second condition is that a full lunar year passes with this amount in your possession. So this brother who borrowed money for a week, the borrower returned it within a week, which means that it did not stay with him for a whole lunar year. So there is no zakat on it. And the person who gave the money as a loan initially, he did not lose track of his cash because it's still his money and it left his possession for a week and came back. So the cycle remains on it. And if it continued a full lunar year, regardless of the week it went or the month or the six month 
he came back, he has to give zakat on that, and Allah Azza wa knows best. And I'm sure the next question is here in Nigeria, we ask some people to recite the Quran for us as the means of prayer, and then we pay them money. Is this allowed? This is not permissible because in generally uh, most cases, when I ask a Maulana to come to my home and recite the Quran, usually I would gather some other people and I would consider his recitation of the Quran in my home as a means of blessing. So giving him money for this purpose, which is originally an innovation, you can read the Quran in your home alone. You can play the recorder. You don't need someone who has a big turban or is known as a Qari to come and recite Quran and charge money for that. You don't need this. This is an innovation. But if someone genuinely wants to listen to the Quran, so I'm a rich man. I listen to the Quran. I read the Quran. But every day after Asr, my family members, maybe some neighbors, we like to sit and just listen to the Quran. So we call Maulana, who has a beautiful voice, and we say to him, Akhi, come and read for us one juzu. So he comes and reads one juzu, and we are listening, contemplating, beautiful. And as he's going, I give him something, because the guy is a Maulana, he doesn't have an income or a job or something like that. There's no, no problem in that. The problem is when I bring him for barakah, for blessing, for protection, for this and that, this is not permissible and Allah knows best. Uh, Namshi, the next question is, I discovered a few years ago, uh, bags of cash should be given on jewelry, but haven't gotten around to some I have had for over 40 years. How does one go about calculating how much is to be given, considering that there are different types, e.g. 24, 25, and 18 carats, and there is white gold, rose gold, and yellow gold. And what of those that have stones on them or watches? Please advise. You have to pay me. I'm a maulana. I will come to you and explain that. You're asking me to give you a summary of the chapter of Zakat in a question and answer. Yeah, and, and the moderator should have been a bit smarter than this, Sheikh Nasser, by selecting a question that is specific. But when you say this question had, has like six, seven uh, uh, embedded questions. One, is there zakat on jewelry? Two, if I didn't pay zakat for the previous years, do I have to pay it now or not? Three, if I didn't know that it was mandatory, should I pay or not? Four. Is the cat on gold, white gold, mandatory or not? Five, six, seven. So this would take us ages, but in a nutshell, the issue of the cat over jewelry, that is gold and silver that women wear as jewels, it's an issue of dispute among scholars. The most authentic opinion is that it is mandatory to give the cat on gold and silver whether a woman wears it or stores it. This is the most authentic opinion. However, due to the long period of time that you did not know about it, and you did not pay it due to denial or not wanting, you simply did not know the ruling, I would, inshallah, say that you don't have to pay any of the back pay of your zakat because there is an issue of dispute whether it's mandatory or not and hence giving you the benefit of the doubt and that you did not know the ruling we say start from this year inshallah white gold if there are two types of white gold there is what they call platinum i think and this is a different mineral than the white the, the yellow gold so it's a different core or metal this is not zakatable and this is halal for men to wear what is haram is the yellow gold is chemically treated to look white so they coat it with a white coating and then they call it white gold this is still haram for men men cannot wear this because 
in essence, it's, it's yellow. And there is zakat on this as well, and Allah knows best. Uh, Nam Sheikh, the next question is, uh, Assalamu alaikum. If one follows a particular madhab, is it permissible for him to listen to uh, other lectures on fiqh from other scholars from different madhab? The madhab itself is not an issue. The issue is in cherry picking. So I don't follow a particular madhab per se, but I cannot jump from Hanafi to Shafi'i, from Shafi'i to Maliki, and so on, according to what appeals to me more, most. I am a student of knowledge. I know Arabic. I have the fundamentals of Quran, Hadith, Usul al-Fiqh, Tafsir, uh, Fiqh, according to the schools of thought. So when I look into a, an issue, I apply these fundamentals in my head and come up with a conclusion that this is the most authentic opinion according to the Quran and the Sunnah. So I follow that. But this is not the same when one of you guys who does not know Arabic, who has never read the Quran, and who has never uh, gone through the Sunnah or learned one school of thought, totally the fiqh of one school of thought from A to Z. Yet he comes and sits on his couch and says, hmm, I think that this opinion is stronger than that one. How do you know? Ah, it's a gut feeling. What kind of gut feeling, Akhi? You're not a neurosurgeon. So if I come to you and say, Akhi, there is pain in my neck, would you say, I have a gut feeling that I think we should amputate your leg? A'udhu Billah. What are you doing? She said, well, I, I'm just picking and, and choosing. No, if you don't have the proper knowledge, you should not hop between different schools of thought and listen to different speakers and follow this one because, mashallah, his beard is white, very black. I don't like Sheikh Asim. His beard is white. Mufti Mink is good. Why? He's younger. He's more handsome. But this is not how it works. Whether you follow me, follow Mufti, follow Sheikh Muhammad Salah, follow X, Y, Z, it has to be structured according to the Quran and the Sunnah. And if you don't have the proper knowledge, you should follow one whom you trust in his religion, in his knowledge, in his uh, ethics and moral, moral conduct. Not go and pick and choose between everything. Yeah, Allah Azza knows best. Uh, now, mashallah, Sheikh. Next question is, Assalamu alaikum. I am adopted by my aunt and raised by her in a different country, officially registered as her son and inheritor. I know my religion does not allow such thing. She also would like me to have a commodities if she passed away. Is there anything, uh, is there anything Islam permits in this case or I am not allowed to have anything given from her? First of all, this is a personal topic that I think the brother should call me or send me an email so that I would have more information. First of all, she is your aunt, paternal or maternal. If she's from your father's side, there's another twist to it. From your mother's side, you cannot inherit her at all because she can be only inherited by her next of kin and you're not one of them. Second of all, you have to change your name. So if you know, if you know who your father's name is, definitely you cannot be called after her. You have to be called after your real father and your real grandfather and your real tribe or family. Third of all, once she dies, if you are not her Islamically legitimate heir, then you cannot inherit her because her parents must inherit her. If she doesn't have any children, then her husband, if she doesn't have a husband, then her siblings, and they're all defined, and we know how much they are to get. Finally, if your aunt wants to allocate something to you now as a gift and hands it to you officially, this is permissible. 
whatever she writes as a will and says, when I die, then my adopted son, so and so would get this and this and this and this. This is not valid except in less than one third of her wealth. So if she had $300, all her property, cash, gold, whatever she had as a wealth. If it was $300,000 and she said, after I die, I give all of my wealth to my adopted nephew. When she dies, you only get 100,000, which is one third. And the rest has to be uh, allocated to her heirs and Allah knows best. I'm Sheikh, and uh, this will be the last question, inshallah. My father thinks that it is okay to socialize and joke with women, and he thinks it's okay to have to not have beard. How can I advise him when his standard response is that he is my father and he has been uh, his whole life? Well, this is something you have to advise him through diplomacy, with knowledge, being diplomatic and respectful. Remember that you can always lead a horse to water, but you can't force the horse to drink. So all what you can do is show him from islamqna.info website, the ruling on mixing and chit-chatting uh, with women who are non-mahram. And how would he feel if his wife were to do something like that? Most, most people don't have any problem. Let her speak. A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah. And you can also show him video clips of mine on my website, if you wish, about these topics, because I have so many video clips on them. And if he doesn't want to listen after that, you've done your due diligence, you've done your duty, and the sin is on him. So don't nag him, don't push it down his throat and suffocate him with it. Try your level best to every now and then remind him of Allah and how Allah is so kind and generous to us and giving us so many things and how um, ungrateful we are due to our sins, etc. Maybe Allah would open his heart. And you have to remember always and forever to make dua for him in sujood and at the times where Allah answers the dua and inshallah uh, uh, he will change.